Financial advisors help Australians live better lives. And we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Open Invest is an innovative Melbourne-based investment platform, giving Australians access to investment portfolios managed by the world's leading investment managers, including BlackRock, JP Morgan, and Schroders. It's ideal for clients and prospects you can't support via traditional financial advice-led portfolio management. Or, if you have your own well-resourced and experienced portfolio management team, Open Invest can customise their tech to give your firm its own digital investing solution. Your brand, your portfolios, your content, accessible directly from your website via general advice. This week, I am lucky enough to talk to Sam Pereira. Sam's the Managing Director of Econ Insurance Services, but he's also the President of the Association of Financial Advisors. He's a father of four and plays sport, and I wanted to know what's going on in his world, what's going on from an association perspective, and frankly, how does he manage it all without falling apart? Perhaps there is something to learn. Please enjoy my chat with Sam. Hello, Sam Pereira. Hello, Jessica Brady. I'm so excited to have you as a guest. <laughs> Finally. I was waiting Finally. for that invite. I know. Well, you know, it's only been a few months now, so you are one of the first, one Indeed. of the first guests. Congratulations. Think- I've heard you're a great host. <laughs> I'm paying lots of people lots of money to say that, so it's <laughs> obviously working. Um, I thought about this the other day. I mm-hmm. think we have known each other for about 15 years. I reckon that would be fairly close, Jess, um, when you were a young whippersnapper. Oh, my gosh, I was five. Well, look, <laughs> in your in your comment sure BDM days, is that right? That's probably where this That's started. That's right. Yeah. And you, my dear, have gone on to do all of this amazing stuff, which we're going to unpack today but I wanted to have you as a guest because a I think you're great b I think it's really nice to hear what's going on from an association perspective and also to be able to overlay sort of what you're finding practically is happening in your business as well I think you're able to give such interesting unique perspectives because you are a practicing advisor and you have a really big role in moving our profession into a exciting new direction and so I'm keen to learn all about that because really honestly and frankly mm-hmm. I have been in my own little let's call it COVID bubble I'm just blaming everything I can on COVID at this point mm-hmm. and I feel that I don't have a good enough grasp of what's happening out there in the big bad wide world and so if we can use our time today to help educate me and perhaps others on what you're fighting no doubt with a good fight I think that that would be very valuable before we get into that though mm-hmm. Can we just, for people that don't know you, can we learn more about Sam? What is your story? Oh, well, Jess, um, I, I was thinking um, before before we get into that, though, I know you're the really? host, but <laughs> <laughs> the, fact, <laughs> the fact that you've been in a COVID bubble and um, someone protected uh, uh, from some of the noise that's been going off is probably a good thing. So mm. let's hope I don't drag you too far into um, some of that noise because I think striking a balance is important. But Look, um, an advisor, I run my, my, my own practice and have, have done so for the duration of, um, you know, the best part of 16 years. Uh, started in the Sutherland Shire, which is exa- uh, um, essentially where our operations still remain and uh, mm. merged and uh, purchased a few practices and have a presence in town as, um, as well. So we're mostly risk-based and um, do some corporate superannuation and some group risk uh, work um as, as well. So, a small boutique firm, um, what have we got, nine, no, ten staff, and um, yeah, it feels as though we're, uh, yeah, we're really hitting our straps, straps um, after about 15 years of hard work. So, um, that's me from a professional sense. Is that sort of what you wanted? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. That's a Sharks fan. <laughs> Love my sport. You've been... <laughs> yeah, you've got um, small ch- – well, they're probably not even small anymore. You've got a couple of kids. Yes, young, young, young families, so kids that sort of keep me grounded. Um, 
And uh, I noticed that uh, in in terms of some of the preparation, not that you gave me much preparation, that you said one of the mm-hmm. rapid fire questions is how um, how of course and apologies um, if you continue my phone. Um, how of course um, do you de stress or let off a bit of steam? But uh, certainly sport is uh, my my thing. Play some team sport and train, and of course a massage and a, and a steam whenever I get a chance to as well. So um, yeah, busy with work. Uh, a young young family and um yeah trying to find some time for myself as well to de-stress because obviously it's um yeah uh, juggling a couple of roles at the moment which i'm uh, enjoying most of the time i love that you've taken over this show my rapid fire questions are for the very end and we've been recording for only a few minutes and you've already gone topsy-turvy you, welcome you sam Pereira. <laughs> you, you, you did say we, we've known each other for 15 years so surely i've got some latitude <laughs> you have lots and lots and lots um just on that so mm-hmm. how do you manage all of that like that's a lot you've got a busy practice that's been established for a long time and it sounds like you've got a number of staff members and you've been through some m&a's and you've got kids and you've increasingly increased your um roles or seniority within the association of financial advisors like do you sleep well no i'd love to say to you that i work 16 hour days and i'm extremely stressed and i do seven days a week but frankly the answer to that question is no i think um yeah. That's not a good thing. <laughs> As you well know, and, and starting a business and going through the you know through through um, staffing and resourcing, I think brilliant teams help you equally. Yeah. Um, you know, the AFA, uh, uh, my good friend Mike, when he uh, hung up the boots in October, when I was contemplating taking over the presidency. Um, uh, you know, my 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 team at at work within the business said, well. You know, when you're running the show, you can organise things how you want to organise them and call your own shots. So I think that autonomy, uh, largely obviously I rely on the executive directors and, and Phil Anderson, who's my very capable set of hands and see at the AFA, but I've got that similar sort of structure here here at the office. So when you when you run your own show, as you well know, Jess, you can organise things to, to, to make it work and, um, you know, jobs and tasks that you enjoy that often not a chore um so great teams enjoy what i do uh, fairly ruthless and say no to the shit most of the time so mm. sorry am um, i allowed to swear oh everyone asks me every week and i say yes i don't know what the official rule is <laughs> but i like to so i say yes and hope that the expert community embrace our um colloquial style of podcasting um coming back to what something that you said before like you would love to say that you work 16 hour uh, days seven days a week i would tell you as someone who tried that and then have burnt myself out it is not a very sustainable solution and so it actually sounds like you have been able to continue to sort of and i want to say this correctly but almost like lift yourself up and to a point within the business where you aren't doing all of the things so you've got the space to be able to take on these extra capabilities is that fair yeah indeed i, th- I, th- I think it was a perfect um whilst uh, we just um, undertaken a, a decent sized merger at the end of last year and some people have thought we we're biting off more than it could chew but it was fairly deliberate in terms of that particular strategy it was scale um is additional resourcing so it gave me the platform um you know to expand what i've been doing over the last 15 years and thereby give me the the time that i need to um want rather to spend on my extracurricular activity activities such as within the afa so um absolutely i I think uh, 15 years of uh, hard work like all of us uh, put in in terms of our businesses starting to pay off uh, dividends by giving me the flexibility to live the life and do the things i want to do Because isn't that what we're all about? Like there's just such a beautiful irony often in our world where we don't practice what we preach. Indeed. And, um, you know, I take it one step further and I talk about, you know, financial advisors advising their clients financially, but do you follow that, um, those sorts of, um, you know, similar mantras in terms of scrutinising your business and your business activities and the acquisition of clients and the... um, you know, just that financial prudence, if if you like. So, absolutely, and, and and the other part of that is, you know, financial independence and goals and objectives, money. Mm. You know, you exchange um, exchange your time for money, but th- that ought to allow you to do what you need to do um, in in life, because as we know, life can be extremely short and extremely delicate. 
Very true. And my general sense is we collectively general generalization. Mm-hmm. We need to do a better job of that. We as advisors or, or we as yeah. people or we as well? You know, I, we as advisors. So when I was in my first job, one of the things mm-hmm. that I did at CBA was I did commission runs for advisors. Mm-hmm. And look, mm-hmm. obviously this is 100 years ago because we've just worked out that I'm very old. Um, <laughs> but the amount of advisors that were needing early commission runs used mm. to blow my mind and I used to sit there and and I was at uni at the time and like on a very entry level job and I kept mm-hmm. thinking isn't this what these people do isn't this their job and I'd love to say that we've gotten better and obviously lots has stood in our way but I think as a general rule of thumb Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you actually sat down and said to most financial advisors, what's your current financial plan? Mm. I'd be fascinated to hear how many of them have a robust enough strategy or as a robust strategy as they'd give their clients. Yeah, uh, I, I think it would be an intriguing uh question um i suspect given the change in sort of business models and the um i suppose the evolution of um Frankly, if you're in the financial services game and you're an advisor that runs your own show, I think you need to, um, you know, have decent business acumen, uh, just mm. given the way that things have evolved and the, 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 the way that things continue to evolve. So okay. that uh, selection process itself, which is a natural selection process itself, ought to dictate uh, that those mm. that are, are left over... Um, Jim Collins, in his hedgehog concept, he says when you when you're in business and you examine the uh, um, the, the the good versus the great companies uh, in America over the um, I think over a hundred years or whatever, he said one of the things that differentiate the the, the top top companies from you know the the, the um, good companies um, is this concept called the hedgehog, uh, and these companies uh, focus on um, what they're deeply passionate about focus on um, their, um, I suppose, what they can be the best in the world at and, and the third being um, that something which drives their economic engine, um, in other words, that, that makes them profit and it's the, it's at the intersection of those three circles where you've got great profitable um, empowered and, and, and progressive companies and um, certainly I think as advisors that run our own practices, we're in business, we're in the business of, of making money. So um, um, part of my job at uh, the AFA and Phil's and, and our board is to make sure that you've got the policy settings that enable you to continue to run um, successful financial practices where you um, you know thrive of the financial success off the back of, back of running good professional practices. What's it like being El Presidente? Oh, well, I... Um, not like Donald Trump or anything like that, but <laughs> um, you know, I I uh, I was in, in in Canberra down for the the federal budget a couple of weeks ago, and obviously met some um, key, key stakeholders, and, and being able to represent the sector and and, and have um, frank and and uh, direct conversations. My my style is trying to build. Um, Deep and personal relationships with some of these people, which which take time. I um, mm. I get off on that, and 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 I'm only able to do that, I suppose, as a result of this um, illustrious title that um, that our members have sort of bestowed upon me. So um, I enjoy that aspect of it. So it opens certain doors to be able to um, walk into certain places and be able to uh, talk on behalf of the the sector. Hopefully, I'm saying the right thing on your behalf. Um, Aside from that, I think also, you know, doing things like uh, such as this, this podcast and this discussion, being able to contribute to um, how I see uh, as a result of my experience and speaking to different people, different advisors, regulators, legislators, etc., where I see things heading, but more importantly, getting a sense of what um, people like you on the ground need to make you even more successful. And um, yeah, so that's kind of what being the president's like, aside from that number of meetings, uh, <laughs> which I don't really enjoy, but... Um, yeah, overall, I'm having a having a good time. I'm there till October, so let's see how we go. Lovely. I wondered whether you know you wear a crown or some sort of like official <laughs> robe, or if there's any sort of you know anything you know beyond what we would normally understand as part of that role. But it sounds like that's not included as part of the role. Um, what are the current priorities? For And from what I understand, there's been quite an evolution, just to sort of backstep, there's been quite mm-hmm. an evolution in terms of um, the AFA and the FPA working quite closely together. So maybe some commentary on that and 
if that is true, what are sort of the priorities that the two of you are working on now? Yeah, um, it is absolutely uh, the case, especially under uh, Marisa Broom and uh, Mike Novak over the last few years and uh, Phil Kewen and, and uh, the CEOs before that, the associations have worked closer together. I think that mm. my, my view is that the sector deserves the two associations to come together and collaborate and use their joint resources on important issues um, mm. because we, we uh, as advisors, deserve the best uh, bang for buck in, in that regard. So it's been continuing and, and um, I have a very uh, good working relationship with, with Marissa. Um, what are mm. we working on at the moment? We've got the life... Um, Joint Life Insurance Task Force, um, the AFA, as you well know, has historically had um, you know strong representation in the insurance area. So whilst we have yeah. this joint task with the FBA, allow us to lead uh, work on that. Um, we were pleased to have played a significant role in um, uh, lobbying against the, the, the next lot of changes that were going to come happen to income protection in October. Um, so we worked with the FPA, but the AFA, uh, you know, see, seemed to lead that conversation and, and strategically did so. And there are other areas where the FPA um, would have um, would have the strategic nous and would be working with them. So working more closely than I think that we've ever had uh, before um, and whoever the, the, the subject matter that we work on uh, depends on who's got the subject matter leads, but got a great working relationship and fundamentally I wouldn't have it any other way. It sounds like that has been working quite well over the last few years and it's exciting to hear that, you know, from a resourcing capability perspective, you both decide who has sort of the natural lead on that task and then take mm-hmm. that forward. We are about to have an election and I think we are very early in the campaigning and already I am ugh, about it. I don't know how you're feeling, but I'm just a bit ugh. What do you think it will actually – do you think it will mean anything for us if there's a change of government? And if so, what's your – What's your thoughts? I haven't prepped Sam on this. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> a question, a question without notice. Uh, do we think there's 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 much in it for us? Um, yeah. Unfortunately, financial services is 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 not a election uh, platform that any particular side uh, will run mm. on. Um, that being that being said, uh, Labor and Stephen Jones preemptively announced some changes to the education standards. Um, to try and, um, you know, we win some um, brownie points with the advice sector, which was broadly received by people who felt as though we were hard done by in terms of recognition of prior prior learning. But, but that being said, I can't see um, – there are no – certainly as far as the coalition is concerned, there are no uh, election um, – policies that they're running with um, uh, right. as, as to the most recent information that I received um, and Labor, there might be one other small thing, we don't know we're, we're, we're working on it to um, uh, to try and convince them uh, but frankly I don't think uh, at a sector level it might make um, too much of a difference in terms of the election, obviously the outcome of the election and whoever gets up is going to be implementing Michelle Levy's quality of advice review um, mm. Mm, which is a <laughs> mm. so yeah that and and, and of course uh, you know um, insurance commissions for example is 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 one of those things where um, I suspect the coalition have more of a bent to um, avoid banning them and um, Labor have probably got a predisposition to ban them although we've made some significant um, inroads in terms of moving Stephen and his team and continue to do so so that's the big one but I think unilaterally. They all agree that regulation, red tape, etc., has gone too far and they need to wind mm. some of that back. So there might be tiny nuances, but I don't think many. Insurance Commission might be the battle, battleground in terms of the diff- significant difference between Labor and Liberal, but we're trying to bridge, bridge that. And, you know, one thing I think about, and maybe I've become, you know, um, cynical and jaded in my five years of giving advice, but I wonder if the regulatory guidelines do soften or, you know, become slightly more relaxed than they are now, how much actual practical impact is that going to have to the advisor who has that big AFSL compliance team in the middle? Like, are are they going to be on board around making some of the the changes necessary to deliver more advice faster, simpler, et cetera, or are they going to take that, you know, um, continue with that tough stance and so I think that'll be interesting because that I do feel like there's so many layers now to getting that actually practically at the coal face changing yeah absolutely and I think you hit on a significant point um, which is something that um, 
you know, I've raised before, it's not necessarily what's written in the laws or the regs. Um, it's perhaps ASIC's enforcement agenda and the way they are sometimes heavy-handed, which then gives licensees um, uh, risk appetites, um, which are um, which are not palatable and, and drive, drive up costs. And that's where you get, you know, checklists and and layer upon layer. So whilst Michelle Levy and the Quality of Advice Review could say we want SOAs down to five pages or whatever, it certainly goes back to licensee um, licensee appetite. But then again, it seems to me there are more and more people making choices in relation to the best way of operating their businesses, whether it be self-licensed or um, aggregating within a licence that's a bit more boutique and um, as an mm. advice partner uh, in terms of being able to deliver advice. So um, I think, yeah, but you, you nail a significant point there because that's uh, certainly where a num- number of complexity and cost comes in, licensee risk appetite. Totally. Um, and so if you had one sort of goal or objective as your time of El Presidente in AFA, have you nailed what that is? Like, do you have one thing that you're like, right, if I leave having done this or having changed this or giving more focus to this, I'll feel like I've done my thing well? Yeah. Look, I think um, if I if I can talk perhaps more broadly about our team's efforts and what's on our agenda rather than, than, than you can do my own. You, <laughs> <laughs> you really want them to think that I'm a selfish egotistical. No, okay, um, yeah. Talk about the team. You're right. Yeah, this is yeah. this is the ecosystem. Sorry. Yeah. Tell tell me what the team are gonna do. Sorry, sorry. No, no, yeah. Um look, I I, I think if we were to talk about what, what success might look like, I think um Certainly, getting a um, getting some wins in terms of the quality of advice review um, mm. would be, and and what does that mean? It means making sure um, we do something in relation to annual re- renewal and the obligations um, to reduce that um, that that burden. Um, it is about Michelle Levy setting down in writing on the sixteenth of December in her paper that. Insurance commissions are important because it gives consumers choice in terms of how they are able to pay their advisors, and perhaps a few little tweaks in and around um, SOAs, um, etc., et where we're removing duplication. I often say, a great example is is the FSG. Um, what is the point of an FSG? But financial advisors, uh, financial advice register, you can work out if li- advisors are qualified, who they're licensed through, etc. Why do we need to get licensees to produce this document, keep it updated, etc.? There's no utility in that, and it's an exercise mm. um, in futility. There you go. That was my uh, mm. rhyme for the day. But um, So I think, yeah, maybe we're, maybe insurance commissions, annual renewal, a couple of other small small um, changes around the traps that are implemented fairly quickly. So, And, ha- and the AFA, we've already met with Michelle Levy and her team and um, will continue to uh, do, do, do that. So, um, you know, being fairly engaged in that, bringing our members along, Michelle's going to go and visit some advice practices um, and see how they operate um, as, as well. So um, hopefully we can play a role in that. Um, so I think that's a big one. I'd like to get our mm. communities together. We've got roadshows coming up and uh, the conferences, of course, you know, you're a, you're a big conference groupie. You've played a significant role. And <laughs> I love a good conference. A good, a good conference, yes. So are you, are you coming? Oh, uh, you have to remind me when it is because remember I'm going away. Oh, yes, of course, September, but, you know, surely you'd make a trip back just for an AFA conference. But um... <laughs> TBA, <laughs> only because I'm trying to be a financial advisor that practices what she preaches and one of my big bucket list things was to spend three months overseas and so I'm about to embark on a three-month trip coming in June. Um, but if not, you know I will be there and I want to say with bells on and I can actually make it with bells on if you want me to if I'm in Australia. <laughs> we'll get you to host a session from um, uh, while well, she's got a backpack on uh, <laughs> from somewhere, <laughs> no somewhere in the world. But no I, I think, yeah, everyone's probably a little bit over it. At, um, aside from the COVID-related pressures and the lockup and the anxieties and all of that, the sectors also, also had our own issues. I think it'd be good to get our, get our um, communities back and um, – I'm fairly harsh on conference content, as you all know. We've had conversations over the sidelines of many different conferences that we've been to where, mm-hmm. um, and especially in this world, um, I don't want our members and our guests paying thousands of dollars, taking you know the best part of a week out of their practice, 
um, to go to somewhere where they take away no real um, value or practical tips. So I'm looking forward to, yeah, our team being able to deliver something that's a little bit different, um, showing people how to thrive, more advisor involvement, um, et cetera. So, and, and, and party, of course, Jess. That's important, right? Yeah, I um I go my theory with conferences and you'll know if you know me is like first on the dance floor, first <laughs> in bed and ready and raring the next day. I'm not a you're making it sound like I'm wild. I I love all of the tips and I come back really energized, but to your point, you come back and you're busy and unless something's quite easily implementable or there's a good accountability framework or a good blueprint in terms of actually practically how do you do this? It just becomes a great idea that gets shoved on the to-do list, which never gets sort of reviewed. And so um, I think in this day and age, more than ever, like how we can practically implement meaningful, profitable changes in our businesses has never been more relevant. Indeed. And I think that that um, that threshold, if you like, is going to increase even further because my view is, and I open this when I'm sitting with the regulators, legislators, and when I, we sat down with Michelle Levy and the quality of advice review team is, you know, it's a bit of a paradox because I'm extremely bullish on the sector. I'm extremely bullish yeah, on the sector. Are. Yeah, because of the people that are left that run professional businesses, the people, the advisors that are left that have got good teams behind them, we are going to have a truckload of clients who are going to want our services. And if we can't afford afford to service X, Y, Z number um, number of clients, well, we'll have to move into the A, Bs and Cs. So I am absolutely bullish about the sector, the opportunities, um, the ability to run financially profitable practices. Um, I guess that the fights that we have are probably a, a, a little bit more in, in the realm of greater, greater good. Um, and the greater good is important because if Australians aren't financially literate, they don't make smart decisions and don't retire well. People like you and me that make good money, we have to pay higher taxes. And frankly, I hate paying tax. I don't know about you. <laughs> um, I like paying Sorry. the right amount of tax. That's how my account is. <laughs> yes. The right amount of tax. No more, no less. Just but the they right don't do a, as, as, Ker- <laughs> as Kerry Packer said, they don't do a good job with it anyway. So why should we give them any more than we ought to? <laughs> oh, tell me. We've, we've, uh, so what I'm hearing in your assessment in terms of like where we're at, obviously the numbers have come down. They've come down significantly to the tune of like 10,000, I think. Um, and so what I'm hearing is your perspective is, yep, we've had a whole heap leave for a variety of reasons. Obviously, Royal Commission, legis- legislative standards and education requirements, also retirement and just how old some of them were. Um, do you think we will stabilise where we are now? Do you see that there's going to be a huge surge in financial advisors over the coming years? Like what are you predicting in terms of numbers? Yeah, look, I think um, certainly it's not as, as, as low as that in terms of um, what, the, uh, what the current status is. And uh, kind of like Anthony Albanese this morning, who didn't know the unemployment rate. I, <laughs> that's only because I've got oh, numbers going in my, in, my, in my head. I think we might be at 17 or, or 15,000, uh, depending on how, how you measure it. Um, so I think over the course of the next couple of years and in, in, in um, line with the education deadline at uh, 2026, we expect um, to lose a few more advisors. Then I suspect we'll plateau. But of course, our issue is uh, the lack of new um, new entrants coming in, um, and that's no secret. The PYU uh, can be quite quite onerous. But I think the practical, um, the other practical overlay of that is in in the past you used to have places like the banks, um, like you know where you started that would bring in advisors through their mm. um, through their various businesses. Uh, so those channels have largely left. Um, and, and for small business, it's going to be important in terms of succession planning and helping us get good talent to service clients. So I think it is a, a, a significant issue uh, and more so about the lack of um, the replenishment in the sector. Um, I think it's a joint issue. I don't think we can just expect government to make the professional use so easy. I, I think, um, Jason, I think we went, we, we were did a session at one of the unis once, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure, to talk to some yeah. uni students. Yeah, yeah, I used to do a lot at the unis and I think I dragged you to one of them. So thank you for attending. But do we have to do more of that? Like is it is it that every financial advisor needs to go and talk to school kids about what financial advisors do so that they pick it for uni? 
I think so because my memory and and you know my memory is failing me as now now that I'm over forty. But uh, was that a lot of a lot of those kids that were studying financial planning, in fact, didn't have any idea about what financial planning is. And and given our, our you know um, a financial planner could be someone that deals in nothing but insurance, could be dealing with aged care, could be mm-hmm. you know budgeting and money, um, you know accumulator coach. So. It's so diverse, I don't think the sector can agree on a, a, a universal definition. So I guess it's up to us to go out there and to talk about sell, sell the wares, um, talk about the diversity, talk about the opportunities um, just now that you're on the dark side about how you can build a fabulous lifestyle and a fabulous business. Um, bread and water, of course, for the first 10 years. Uh, but um, mm-hmm. <laughs> being, <laughs> Um, the benefits of, of, of the sector, and, and um, I don't think there are many other professional services um, roles that enable you to build a business and um, take control of a destiny and build build an asset just of financial services. So we've got to get out there and uh, get on the front foot. So I think that's up to the sector. People like AFA, the FPA, it's not really government's role. It's up to us. We just haven't been able to do it because we've been too busy holding a fire hose, putting out fires over the last three or four years. So, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's annoying. It is annoying. And and, um, we are all going to be scrambling to hire from the same resource pool. So we all... It, we all have a vested interest in in widening the amount of people that know what we do. You know, one of the things that I learned from going into a lot of unis, so this is probably seven years ago, I would go into quite a lot of Sydney unis um, to try to help them understand broadly the sector and also the mm-hmm. types of different roles that exist. Uh, and often people would say to me, I didn't know that a finan- I thought a financial advisor would be far more analytical. And so there's, of course, this perception that it's much more sort of numbers based. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I spend most of my time coaching people and, you know, there's lots of tears and it's, it's much more emotional. And so I also think educating people on that side of things, particularly for women, I think most women are good at that and like that. And that's why they can make really good financial advisors. But I don't think we do a very good job of educating young people that that's a big part of it so i'm just gifting you that to think about because uh, you need more to do clearly um but (laughs) you know like i think getting financial literacy into schools and getting the opportunity for financial advisors to go and talk to in schools to schools when we're allowed um Mm -hmm. i know that's something that the afa has talked about for a long time i guess that it's possibly time to start picking those ideas back up yeah, and, and, and this is where we, when we talk about, you know, working together with other stakeholders and joint resourcing enables you to do some of these things that you otherwise wouldn't have got an opportunity to do and that makes a meaningful difference to the sector. I think they're the sorts of energetic initiatives that um, I hope to be able to achieve once we get through this quality of advice um, review. But, of course, uh, our good friend Russell Collins, as he says, he says, our business, 95% people knowledge, 5% technical knowledge, and you better know 100% of the 5%. So, uh, But you're, you're yeah. spot on. It's all about people, relationships, uh, which you, of course, excel at. Hey, is that a stranger trying to get into your house because your dog was barking earlier or what? Oh, my dog is, your is dog? <laughs> security guard there ever it was. Um, and it's the time of day where people walk past the, the house. So she's just doing like a <laughs> Hello, welcome. I hope you had a nice day at work. Um, <laughs> don't forget to cook dinner and eat your vegetables. She just barks at every person that goes past the house. <laughs> very no sorry problem. No, all good. Um, she has been walked. I sometimes think that people think I'm an neglectant parent, but I'm not, not at all. Um, so you do talk about the sector <clears throat> In, in a really optimistic way, and mm-hmm. I can see totally, I mean, that's why I decided to jump onto the dark side, as you put it. Um, mm-hmm. What do you think advice will look like in five or ten years? Like what's your big picture? What do you think is like the future for us? Yeah, um, what will advice look like in five years? So we're talking about, what, 2027. 20, 20, um, one of, one of the concepts that's easy, interesting to see comes through, and, and, and I don't mean to get technical or political, but I'm, I'm, I'm bet that way, is, um, you know, there might be better clarification in terms of financial advisors, what they do. So you might find that people that, you know, are specialised in provide comprehensive advice, um, there's a cohort of those people. You might find that people that provide general advice, those flim, influence, et cetera, they've got a safe space to do whatever they need to do uh, increase financial literacy, um, 
provide cost-effective solutions, uh, integration of fintech, etc., which is not too regular, regulatory heavy. Caveat mTOR consumers know exactly what they're getting and what they're, what they're not, not, not getting. Um, and then in the middle, perhaps, you might have, and this is just throwing darts, to be honest with you, but this is how I would design it if I was the chair of the quality advice review. Uh, in the middle, perhaps, you would have a whole bunch of advisors that specialise in, in, in niches, um, which is consistent with your requirements and expectations under FASIS Code of Ethics, uh, etc. where you've got insurance specialists, you've got aged care specialists, you've got retirement specialists, um, etc. So... Bigger, scalable businesses that offer comprehensive solutions, comprehensive advice, uh, different end of the spectrum that's more about education and, and mass markets in a cost-efficient way, and in the middle, uh, dealing with a, a bunch of very competent professionals that uh, specialise in their niche. Um, that's that's perhaps uh, how I would like to see it. Uh, yeah, the, the 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 sector, yeah, uh, evolve. Evolve. Mm. Exactly like the medical world and the legal world, where typically you've got, well, you know, apart from the the GP, you are a specialist in your field. And from a legal perspective, of course, they know general law, but most of them become specialists in a type of law as well. And so, as we progress and things get more nuanced, I think that's a really interesting take. One I hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about, but it does make Mm -hmm. a huge amount of sense if you look at those other professions that have implemented that really well and perhaps similar to those you can end up with multi multidisciplinary advice businesses that have those very niche specialist people within them but then navigating that relationship piece would be fascinating mm. interesting um sammy i saw some stats a little while ago and it was pretty rough the mental health of financial advisors at the moment isn't great what are your thoughts on what we can do cuz we're tired I hear this a lot. In fact, I just got off the phone to someone who I have known for a very, very long time and he is much more in touch with other advisors. And I said, what are you seeing? And he said, Jess, people are tired. Is that, I mean, firstly, do you agree? And secondly, what can we do to help ourselves get out of this so that we start feeling like we're thriving? Yeah. So I I absolutely agree with you. I think the, um, Certainly, the COVID-related pressures that every Australian have felt, we've felt um, over and uh, beyond that, we've had to deal with um, the Royal Commission recommendations. Now, I say even the most successful practices in the country were significantly implemented by, uh, impacted by some of those recommendations because they had to adjust business models for changes that came in in October last year, annual renewal, etc. Labor-intensive. Mm took us away from the, 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 the very reason as to why we existed, you know, as to serve clients, be in front of clients, etc. So everyone copped it as a result of the changes out of, out of the R- RC um, and, 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 and other measures. Um, and over and beyond that, if you're having to coach clients through a pandemic, the, the, the burden of, of, you know, we t- the good practitioners, um, they take on their clients' problems um, and um, they're emotionally invested and they're, they're empathetic. So you have that third layer as well. So um, trying to pass exams. So I, I get it. I, I'm, a, I'm an advisor. I, you know, I practice. So I, I, I live in the same, same world. Um, mm. How do we turn it around? I think um, when we spoke to you, you, you said, you know, started the uh, podcast, I was going to say interview, you said that, you know, turning down, you were able to turn down, or rather by choice or design, you were uh, out of it for a little while and have been. I think um, we probably need to, I'm asking you to, to turn down the noise a, a little bit. I'm asking the sector to turn down the noise a little bit. That does not mean that we're um, not empathetic to the needs of people that still have to pass the exam, that have to mm-hmm. navigate four, five, six, seven, and maybe eight subjects over the course of the next five years. But rest assured, we are working uh, our butts off, a small team with a massive agenda to give you the stability as best as possible in terms of the platform for you to um, for you to be able to build your businesses and, and, and service your clients in the most cost-efficient way that doesn't... Um, uh, diminish consumer detriment. So leave that work to us. Engage constructively. Focus on the fact that you've got incredible clients. Um, there will be a plethora of them. 
you do incredible work um, and focus on the, the, the areas that you can you can control because if we get through this, if you get through your education, we will no doubt get some wins out of the quality of the advice review and both sides have said that they're looking for some recommendations regardless of who is in government to be able to table and implement in, 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 in the first part of 2023. So... Um, it's not going to be transformative, but we will get some wins and we've got unilateral acknowledgement. So I think have some confidence in the sector, worry about what you can control, have some trust in the people that are in the chairs that are trying to make it make a difference um, mm. and just march on, I'm afraid. that's yeah. yeah, but I think you touched on a piece earlier that is so unique to us and that's mm-hmm. community. We mm. we are such a community and probably why I feel like I've been out of touch is possibly because I'm so used to being able to see everyone and, and we are so good at sharing goods and bads and uglies and, of course, we've been in our own small cave for the past few years. That surely has an impact. And so I guess, you know, an action item for me maybe off the back of this is to get a bit more involved from a community perspective because I've been in my own little um, work COVID yeah. hat. Look, I think, yeah, without, without a shadow of a doubt, a problem, you know, shared is a, is a problem halved and just to speak to people in terms of how they're navigating it in a, in a, in a positive sense. Like you, you, it's not getting together with people and, you know, it's about woe is me or wallowing in, in, our, in our issues. It's about getting together with like-minded people that believe in the future, that have some hope but are able to talk frankly and put their issues on the table and talk about how difficult it's it's been and, and mm. perhaps, you know, what, what they're looking for. So um, I, I sincerely hope sort of some of the events that we're going to run over the course of the next um, few months um, enable us to, to get yeah, good people to, together. Amazing. Is there anything else that I've forgotten slash not asked you that you would like to talk about before we move on to the rapid fire questions that you tried <laughs> to put at the front of today's session? No, 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 I don't. Um, I don't think so. We're uh, out of time. Otherwise, I would have asked you a, you a couple of questions. But um. <laughs> I don't know what a shame. Man. I'm out of time. Um, in all seriousness, like you are a very busy person, and mm-hmm. this is an interesting time to have you on board, both from a, an advocacy piece as the association, but also understanding, you know, what does this election actually mean for us, and getting your thoughts on it is is really helpful and relevant. So I want to say an enormous thank you because um, I really do value your time and I'm so grateful to have you on here and very excited to see all of the amazing work that you're going to continue to deliver to the AFA. No problem, Jess. Uh, Happy to be here. And I I should have said uh, in Queensland in particular, there are a number of functions and events that have been, that have been held with and jointly with the FPA and with XY advisor and the SMSF um, association as well. And it pleases me uh, to no end to see that sort of collaboration and people getting together um, as well. So um, that was thrilled to uh, come and come and chat to you because it's been some time. I've got to get on a podcast to be able to talk to you. How's that for? <laughs> like a queen a public, we're going to have to show some camaraderie and, and um, co- competitiveness and get organised from a New South Wales perspective. And yes, if you do want to speak to me, just book in a podcast session with me and we can have a wonderful 40 minutes about it. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's give you some time back. Let's fire off your last rapid fire questions. The reason I do this is because I love hearing people's insights in terms of their speciality, but I also want to remember that we're human and we have lots of insights and knowledge to impart onto each other. And if we can all take one thing, you know, that's um, the cumul- the compounding and cumulative impact of that is huge, as James Clear says in Atomic Habits. So one thing. That you do to look after your mental health. Uh, I think my team sports. I play. I was tag and, and, and touch footy, so that's important to me. Run around with my mates and have a bit of physical activity. Good on you. I got banned from um, banned from Oztag because I accidentally tackled a man. I just forgot to stop and I barreled him over and he became <laughs> injured. So that ended my Oztag career. Um, what is one piece of advice that you would give your younger self? Um, I was thinking about this. Um, hasten slowly. So taste. Take risks. It's important to take risks, but on important life decisions, um, take your time on them. You That's are cryptic. fascinating man who holds space for both sides of the argument. I like that. Uh, what is one big thing on your bucket list that you haven't ticked off yet? Um, again, I was thinking about this, and I could tell you something way you know out of this world, like I don't know skydive or something like that, but. 
I haven't been to a dinner on Blanc yet, and my 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 wish is to try and get to a dinner on Blanc this year, and uh, perhaps in Sydney in, in a few weeks' time. Oh, that's a small um, one. No, that's great. If you don't know what that is, it's basically everyone gets together at all these different venues, and you wear all white. Correct. Indeed. Yeah. Don't just don't ask me own. why. I, yeah. If you if you don't get a ticket, just set up your own in your backyard and charge people. There's some diversification of income streams for you. <laughs> that's a great idea for an AFA event. Oh, here we are brainstorming for the conference. There you yeah. go. Uh, my last question to you. A book for you to read, for me, no, you've probably hopefully read it, a book for me to read as part of my fake book club. Got any? Fiction or non-fiction or what? Whatever you think I need to read. What do you like to read, fiction or non-fiction? I do this thing where I read two books at once. So typically I read fiction and non-fiction at the same time. I'm currently reading um, uh, a fascinating book around the history of finances, which um, um, by Niall Ferguson, um, The Ascent of Money, which is very interesting. Um, uh, but you can give – I go, I'll read anything. <laughs> Well, talk about well. Let's talk about impact, and I think I'll stay away from the business world because we're talking about uh, business world. But um, Ellie Wiesel, who was a Holocaust um, survivor who only died, um, I think he died two years ago. I forget COVID's um, messed my mind up in terms of time frames, as, 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 as always. But he, uh, one of his accounts of, of, of uh, the Holocaust is a book called um, uh, Night. Um, it's a very short book, but it's profound because. Um, he vividly describes um, seeing some of the horrendous um, atrocities of that particular period in our very uh, sad, sad history, and uh, it's extremely profound. Uh, it impacted him. He gave up his his, his faith, uh, but then lived on to accomplish uh, many, many wonderful uh, things. And um, in fact, I think also received a Nobel Peace Prize. But um, uh, it's called Night, Nacht, um, but only, only was ill. Thank you. That sounds fascinating. A huge thank you for everything that you're doing, not only in today's podcast, but in a general Mm -hmm. sense. Thank you for being you. Thank you for taking on the good fight. We know it's a lot of work. We know sometimes there's lots of hours and often there's not enough recognition of all the hard work. So on behalf of everyone, I wanted to say a giant thank you for being part of today and more broadly, all the great work you're doing to continue to evolve our profession. Thanks, Sammy. Thank you, Jess, at any time. And thanks for having me and um, keep up the good work to all our friends or advisors out there. So, um, yeah, have a good year and uh, hope to be back or hope to be invited back some stage soon. We'll see. We'll see if you can get back. <laughs> <laughs> you can come back whenever you like. <laughs> thanks, Sammy. Thanks, Jess. <laughs>